I'm Conor Houghton and this is a half of one of two lectures I give on computational neuroscience as part of the unit PHPH2 0007. Uh, the notes are on the GitHub shown there. Uh, here I'm going to talk a bit about modelling. Modelling is one of the basic tools of computational neuroscience. It's a way of uh, taking what it is we can measure and relating it to what it is we want to know. So in neuroscience experiments are often very difficult. What we can actually measure uh, is often different from what we need to know to answer the questions we have. Modeling provides a translation one to the other. So for example, I have a student who works on synapses. She's interested in the dynamics of the physicals in the synapse. What she can measure are the postsynaptic uh, potentials. And so she uses a model of the synaptic dynamics to relate uh, the measurements, the amplitudes of the PSPs, uh, to ideas about how the physicals release their neurotransmitter into the, into the cleft. Uh, more generally, uh, modelling, uh, we hope, helps us relate um, what we measure uh, to how or why questions ab about the brain. We want to start off with the electrodynamics of neurons or the molecular dynamics inside the cell, and we want to relate that to ideas about what it is a neuronal circuit is doing, what, for example, computational function it might serve uh, in the brain. Here, uh, we're going to talk about the leaky integrated fire model, the leaky integrated fire model is a model uh, of neurons. It is a, a, a simple model. There is a, a more, not, there are more complicated models of neurons that can capture more of the behavior of a neuron. But the Hodgkin-Huxley model, the, the, the standard model uh, for neuronal dynamics, includes a, a part that looks a lot like the integrated fire model. And in fact, the leaky integrated fire model uh, captures uh, an important part of the behavior of neurons. And so we're going to talk about that equation here, gain some intuition for what it is that, that neurons uh, do to their input uh, based on the leaky integrated fire model. The leaky integrated fire model, of course, is still uh, used uh, in a network model where you've got lots of neurons interacting. If what you're interested in is the behavior that emerges from the network, the leaky integrated fire model might well be an accurate enough model of the actual neuronal dynamics, coupled with properly some uh, model of, of the synapses. So it's still an important part of the uh, models used by computational neuroscientists, and also a model which uh, provides insight into what neurons uh, do. In fact, uh, in this part of the lecture, we're not going to talk about the leaky integrated firewall model. We're going to talk about the dynamics of the height of water in a leaky bucket. The reason for that is, well, it's easier to talk about buckets than, than cells. Uh, instead of charge, as you'd have in a, a neuron, we talk about the volume of water. Instead of uh, the voltage or potential, we talk about the height of the water. But it turns out that the equation is the same. In fact, the equation that we're going to see here describes the dynamics of a leaky bucket is found again and again across biology. Uh, we're interested, of course, not directly in buckets, but in the equations. And so we're going to take a kind of idealized view of this uh, leaky bucket. For example, the, the sides of this bucket are uh, perfectly uh, perfectly vertical, which uh, would be bad for stacking buckets, but is uh, useful to make the equations simpler and indeed more like the equations that describe a, a neuron. So in this uh, leaky bucket, we have water flowing in from a tap like so. The idea might be that you can control the flow by turning the tap, just as uh, for example, in a neuron, if you had a stimulating electrode in the neuron, you could adjust the current into the neuron by changing the current into the electrode. We also have the water itself gathering in the bucket, and then we have water coming out at the leak at the bottom. So it's about a, a bucket with a hole at the bottom. Uh, obviously, the uh, speed the water comes out the bottom depends on the pressure of the water at the bottom, and that depends uh, on the height of the water in the bucket. So for example, if we increase the flow of water into the bucket, like so, uh, the, uh, there'll be more water flowing into the bucket than is flowing out. As a consequence, the height of the water in the bucket will rise until the pressure at the bottom is enough for the water to come out the leak fast enough so the outflow at the bottom balances the inflow at the top. Conversely, if we now turn down the tap, uh, the outflow at the bottom is greater than the inflow at the top. That means that the uh, level of the water in the bucket will drop until the flow out through the leak uh, is small enough to balance the flow in from the tap. And that's the dynamics that we want to capture in the model of, uh, of how the height of the water in the bucket changes with time. So some notation, uh, h of t in red there is the height of the water, i of t is the rate of flow into the bucket, and we note in passing that it's a rate of flow, it will be measured in volume per time, like liters per second or whatever. Uh, similarly, the leak at the bottom, l of t, is the flow out of the bucket, and that's also uh, a volume per time. 
uh, let's talk a little bit more about the leak. So the, uh, the speed the water uh, flows at the bottom uh, is proportional to the height. The bigger the height, uh, the, the, the faster the flow at the bottom. Um, to some reasonable approximation in physics, uh, that would be a linear relationship. It would be complicated slightly by the viscosity of the water and the turbulence, but we're not uh, interested in, in, in the physics here. And so we'll imagine, as is you know almost true, that uh, there's a direct proportionality. If you double the height of the water, you will double the size of the leak. If you have the height of the water, you have the size of the leak. In other words, there's a linear dependence between them. And so we write this as L of t is equal to some constant, uh, which we'll call big G, uh, times H of t. And, and G, of course, uh, could be calculated from the physics, but uh, here we'll just leave it as, as G. So in summary, now we have water flowing in and water flowing out. So the net flow into the bucket is the in minus the out, I of t minus L of t, or as we've just uh, written it, I of t minus G H of t. And again, we remember that this is a flow, so it's measured in volume per time. So the thing that is changed by the flow, if there's if I of t isn't equal to L of t, the thing that changes is the volume. The volume will change with time. So we need to work out the volume. We're interested in the, the dynamics of the height. It's the height that affects uh, the leak, but the leak and or indeed the, the net inflow affects the volume. And so the volume is going to be proportional, linearly proportional to H of T. In fact, uh, you know, there's a formula for the volume of a cylinder, uh, it's pi r squared H. And so the volume is equal to C H of T, where C is equal to pi r squared H. But again, uh, we're just going to call it C because we want to do this in a way that makes it easier to apply uh, to the neuron case at the end. So we shouldn't get too hung up on the shape of the bucket. So the idea now is that the volume is going to change in time because the net flow into the bucket is not zero. I is not the same as G of H, G H in general. Uh, and so if something changes with time, well, the mathematical machinery for describing how something changes in time is the derivative. DV dt is the change in the, in the volume uh, per time. And so we have the change in the volume per time is equal uh, to the net uh, flow into the bucket. Um, just uh, as, a, as a side note, uh, you'll notice that, you know, originally when we were writing about H and L and I, we put a brackets T out to them to emphasize that they were functions of time. Uh, often when we're writing differential equations, or indeed just generally, we sometimes drop those brackets T not uh, for any uh, meaningful reason, not because uh, we mean to change our mind about whether V depends on T, but rather just to stop the equation getting too cluttered. So in this equation here, dV dt equals I minus G H, uh, because we've already seen them, we know that V, I, and H depend on time and could be written with the brackets T, whereas the G is a constant. Now, uh, V, we already saw, uh, is equal to C times H. And so we can substitute that in. So where we had dV dt, we now have dCH uh, dt. And d dt is the rate of change of time. C is a constant, and so it can, can be brought outside of the derivative. The rate of change of CH with time is the same as C times the rate of change of H with time. And so we get the bottom equation at the bottom, C times dH dt is equal to I minus G times H. That's uh, almost the end, we've almost got to the equation we want uh, to consider, uh, just for convenience, and because it makes some of the later equations slightly easier to write down, uh, we divide across by the G. So we divide everything by the G, so in we used to have a C dH dt, now we have C over G dH dt, and we call that tau. And again, on the right hand side, we now have a one over a G in front of the I. Uh, now, why do we call it tau? Well, uh, tau is the Greek letter equivalent to T, the Greek letter that made a T sound or makes a T sound. Uh, and so we often use tau for things to do with time. And we call this tau actually a time scale. And the reason uh, for that is it does have the units of time. If you look at the right-hand side of the equation, you have, for example, the H there, uh, the units of H, the measurement for H would be distance. On the left-hand side, you have the dH dt. That's distance per time. The units for dH dt might be you know, meters per second or centimeters per hour or whatever. But dH dt is measured in uh, distance per time. On the equation, the units have to balance on both sides. And the only way that can happen would be if this tau thing had the units of time. Uh, in fact, you know, if you go through it and check and check what units C have and what units G has, uh, that's actually you know, directly uh, demonstrable. Uh, tau has the units of time. So tau. Uh, is measured in time, and so it's appropriate to call it um, tau. So uh, we want to solve this equation. In fact, you can write that equation uh, in terms of an integral. So you can take um, take the equation uh, tau dh dt is equal to 1 over g i minus h, and you can write so h is equal to some integral, and often you can uh, do that integral. Uh, however, we're not especially interested in finding analytic solutions to this equation, because in the case that we're going to be interested in, um, in the case of neurons, uh, 
we, we, we won't, it won't be useful to, to write down the solution analytically, rather we're going to solve it numerically, as we'll discuss in due course. But it is uh, useful, I think, to see what happens if the uh, input is, uh, is constant. So we're imagining now that we've switched on the tap and we're just leaving the tap uh, without fiddling with it further, so there's a, a constant rate the water is flowing into the bucket. And to emphasize that, we'll write I bar instead of I. So the equation now is tau dh dt is equal to 1 over g i bar minus h. The first thing to notice about uh, this equation is that there's an equilibrium value. If h is equal to i bar over g, uh, then the right-hand side is 0, and so the left-hand side is 0 too, and so dh dt uh, is equal to 0. And so if h is equal to i bar over g, then uh, h uh, doesn't change with time. dh dt is 0, and so that's an equilibrium point. By setting h to be that value, uh, the, the equation say that h stops changing. So that would be if the height of the water was exactly at the point where the outflow matched the inflow. Furthermore, if h is bigger than i bar over g, then the right-hand side is going to be negative. Uh, 1 over g i bar minus h will be negative, and so dh dt will be negative too, uh, assuming uh, tau is positive as, as it is. Uh, so uh, if um, if h is greater than i bar g, in other words, if the height is above the equilibrium value, then dh dt is negative, and so the height will fall. And so if the water is above the equilibrium value, it falls to the equilibrium value, and we saw that before. So here the water is above the equilibrium value, uh, here dh dt will be negative, and the water will fall until it approaches the equilibrium value. And the converse is also true. If h is less than i bar over g, then dh dt will be positive, and the water will rise uh, back up towards the equilibrium value. So what we have is what we call a stable equilibrium. If you move um, h away from the equilibrium value, it'll head back uh, towards it. Uh, we can say slightly more, actually. Um, the uh, further the h is from the equilibrium value, the faster it will return. If you look at the case where h is less than i bar over g, then the uh, smaller h is, uh, the bigger the, the, the right-hand side is, the bigger dh dt is, and so the faster uh, h will, uh, will increase. So the further h is below the equilibrium, the faster it will increase towards the equilibrium, and vice versa. If h is greater than i bar over g, uh, the, it will, the, the more it's greater than i bar over g, the faster it will fall towards i bar over g. So those are the dynamics of the uh, leak integrated and fire model when the input current is, is constant. In fact, we can write down the solution. This is the solution uh, to that equation. h of t is equal to h of 0 minus i bar over g, the equilibrium value, all multiplying this e to the minus t over tau plus i bar over g. Um, we're not going to go through how you solve the equation here. It's actually reasonably straightforward to use something uh, called an integrating for factor, for example. Uh, but needless to say, this is the solution. Uh, in that uh, solution, we have h of 0 is supposed to be the, the starting value, the initial condition. We're sort of assuming that uh, the, the we have the value at t equals to 0, and we're looking what happens after that. Uh, if we were starting at a different value, then you might have h of t sub 0, or h of t1, or something. Either way, h of 0 represents the value when t equals to 0, which we're taking to be the initial value where we're starting the equation off. And we're saying we're starting off with h at some value. Let's see what happens after that. Uh, the other important thing is the e to the minus t over tau. That's the exponential function. Uh, it's sometimes written in this other form, exp of minus t over tau. And the exponential is one of the standard functions of mathematics, you know, like sine and, and cos r. It's one of the functions that you can get in your calculator or, or is in a book of logs in the old days. And these special functions are actually typically functions that arise out of important differential equations. The exponential is important precisely because it solves uh, differential equations that look like this one. Uh, this is what the exponential looks like. This is a plot of y is equal to e to the minus t. You can see at t equals to 0, it's equal to 1. And then as uh, t gets larger, it approaches uh, 0. So e to the minus t gets smaller and smaller and smaller. The closer it gets to 0, the slower it changes. And so it wouldn't actually reach 0 until it you know, got to infinity, but it gets uh, incredibly close uh, reasonably quickly. Um, if you had e to the minus t over 2, well, then you have to increase t to twice as much to get the same uh, argument to the to the e, and so it falls uh, half as fast. You can see uh, it falls slower, and if you have e is equal to 2t, which would correspond to tau equals to half in the solution, it falls uh, much faster. So the, uh, the tau in the solution determines how quickly that exponential uh, falls. For a small value of t, it falls it falls quite quickly. For a large value of t, it, it falls much slower. But either way, you can see that the e to the minus t over tau uh, decays away towards 0, and h of t then approaches i bar over g, which we know is the equilibrium value. And so the solution of the equation, the dynamics, is that uh, it's the h starts off somewhere away from the equilibrium, and then it will move towards the equilibrium uh, 
in this typical exponential curve. Here are some examples. So here, i bar has been chosen equal to g, so the equilibrium value is 1. Tau has been chosen equal to 1, and we start off at three different values. So the, um, the 1 uh, corresponds to the equilibrium value. If we start at 2, we fall towards it. If we start at 3, we fall, uh, still fall towards it, and then we start off uh, falling faster. Uh, and similarly, if we start at 0, we rise towards it. So that's the, the behavior of the uh, solution to the equation uh, based on that, that, um, the, the solution that we just looked at. I've just plotted it out, but also uh, matches our intuition, what we discussed uh, uh, before, which is that um, that h will go towards the equilibrium value, and the further away it starts, uh, the, the faster it approaches uh, initially. Um, so that's the, the case for uh, constant input. Uh, now, of course, in the case we're interested in a neuron, the input into a neuron is not going to be constant. It's going to be the result of the firing of other neurons and the postsynaptic pulses coming in from the uh, synapses through the dendrites, or indeed if it's uh, sort of in vitro preparation, the current being pumped into the neuron uh, by the electrode, which we might um, change uh, in order to investigate the response of the neuron. So we're not going to be interested in the uh, constant input necessarily, we're interested in the variable input. Uh, and to solve for variable input, as I said before, uh, you can do it, you can uh, change the uh, you can rewrite the equation so that you have written h of t directly as a as an integral, but uh, often that's not useful and doesn't give you much insight. And it does as assume that you kind of know what i of t is. But if you are evolving a network of neurons, you won't know what i of t is in advance because uh, the i of t will be the consequence of the firing of the other neurons, the spikes going from from neuron to neuron. So often it's not useful uh, practically to solve the equation analytically. That is to write it down as we did for the constant. A case of h of t is equal to some known mathematical functions. Rather, we solve it numerically, which is basically for different time steps, for different points in time, we work out um, the exact number, not the equation, but the number that gives us what, what h is. And we'll talk about how to solve the equation numerically in a minute. But before we do that, we can still, even from the constant case, uh, gain some insight or some intuition for what might happen in, in the variable case. So in the variable case, um, at a given moment in time, uh, you have uh, i over g, um, and you have i over, i over g minus h, and that gives you a value of dh dt. And if the same, if h is less than i over g, dh dt will be positive. Uh, if uh, h is bigger than i over g, dh dt will be negative. In other words, h will travel towards, at any given moment, h will move towards whatever i over g is. Uh, and we saw that uh, the value of tau we can think of as um, as showing how fast it will decay. And so we can think of the solution to the equation, if the uh, input is variable, as h trying to get to i over g. If uh, i over g is constant, h will uh, decay exponentially towards i over g. But if i over g is, is changing, then by the time h gets towards it, it will have moved on somewhere else. So in other words, the solution that we see, the dynamics, and we'll see a picture in a second, is one where h is chasing i over g. If um, tau is very small, it will be quite close to it. If tau is uh, larger, it, will, it, it won't be so close. Well, let's have a look at the picture. So here we set i of t equals to sine of t as an example. We start at h of 0 equals to 0, and we look at three different tau values. So uh, in this picture, the input is given by the uh, very small dotted line. It's the sine function. It's the one that goes right up to 1 and then right down uh, to minus 1. Uh, uh, if tau is equal to 0 0.25, that's a small value of tau in this case, compared to how rapidly sine of t is changing, you can see that that's the solid black line. It's, it's, uh, the solution is pretty much uh, tracing the input. But if you look at t tau equals to 4, and that's the dashed line, uh, then uh, it's not doing such a good job of chasing it. By the time it's getting towards um, uh, tau, uh, getting towards the input, the input is already falling. And if, in fact, what you see is that the solution kind of smooths out the um, the function because it's always chasing the function. But it's always a little bit behind. The function goes one way, it comes the other way, and so the uh, the solution doesn't trace out all of the uh, oscillations of the input and gives you a, some sort of a smoother version. It is, in fact, like a uh, an averaging over the past values of input with the past discounted according to the exponential. Uh, that's often referred to by engineers in particular as filtering. So the, the output, the solution here, filters the input. It smooths the input over the time scale indicated by tau. 
So for tau equals to four, it's smoothing the input over a sort of time scale of four-ish. Uh, for tau equals 0 0.25, it's smoothing the input over a time scale of 0 0.25. In other words, since the uh, input is changing at a time scale uh, that's kind of around that um, that time scale, uh, the uh, the solution looks a lot like the input. And so that's kind of the intuition for what's happening uh, to the to the solution to this differential equation. The solution tries to chase the input. It does it uh, on the time scale given by tau and ends up then giving a smooth version uh, of the input. If that intuition is enough and we actually want numbers, uh, then we're going to have to use a, a numerical approach. A numerical approach, as I said before, is using a computer uh, not to work, uh, not to write down the solution in terms of some function, but to write down values of uh, that the solution will have at different points in time. And uh, that allows us to solve the differential equation um, to give numbers using a computer. Uh, the numerical approach we're going to take uh, is the Euler approximation. It's kind of the uh, the simplest uh, numerical approach to solving differential equations, but it's also kind of paradigmical. A lot of the other approaches are just more complicated versions of the uh, Euler approximation. So imagine you have a cyclist cycling at five uh, meters per second, and you know where they are now, and you want to know where they will be uh, a second later. Well, uh, after a second, you have the, the rate of change of their position, uh, the velocity, uh, five meters per second, a second has passed, and so you imagine that they've traveled uh, five meters. Now, you don't know that, or you have no reason to expect that that will be exact. You know uh, when the, the cyclist is starting off that they're going at five meters per second, but over the second, they might have changed the speed. They might have started pedaling faster or slower. However, you know, for a cyclist, they don't change their speed that much over a second. So you imagine that this five meters per five meters is going to be slightly approximate because you don't know that they're going to go at exactly five meters per second all through the second. But you imagine that it's their, their velocity is not going to change that much throughout the second. And so five meters is a pretty good guess uh, to how far they've gone. If you wanted to keep tracking their, their uh, position and you were able to ask them every second what their speed was, well, now you'd ask them again, you know, what their speed was. Maybe they're now going at 4.9 met uh, meters per second. And so you'd guess over the next second, they would go 4.9 meters rather than uh, five meters. But you'd be leaving off the fact that uh, during the previous second, they hadn't been continuously at going at five meters per second. They've been uh, slowing down a tiny bit during that second. So that's the approximation we're going to work to. So just to sort of set things up, imagine you have a differential equation, uh, df dt is equal to big F of f comma t. So that's like a more general version of what we were looking at before. In our bucket case, uh, where we have h instead of f, and big F of t, the thing on the right hand side, in the case of the bucket was i divided by g minus h over tau. But this is the same, I, I move the t you move the tau from the left to the right just to make things more convenient for what we're going to do next. But, th but this is basically the situation, the differential equation the, the, of the sort that we had, first order differential equation, it's an equation for df dt, where f is the thing we're interested in, in our case, uh, a h, not an f. But this is the sort of general example. And what we're going to use is this approximation, the one that we just uh, mentioned before, which is that the uh, position or the value of f at t plus delta t. So we imagine we know what the value of f is at t. We're interested in, in a short time later. In the case of the cyclist, that was a second later. If we're doing neuro neuronal simulations, a small amount of time, that is the time smaller than the typical fluctuation time of the uh, of the neuron would be like one millisecond or uh, sometimes uh, a tenth of a millisecond. But, uh, but the idea is that delta t is a small amount of time. And what we imagine is that uh, the value of f at t plus delta t is the value of f plus a small amount of time multiplied by uh, how the rate of change of f df dt, which from our differential equation is big F. Uh, in other words, the, uh, the, like in the cyclist, the position uh, after a second is the position now plus the velocity uh, by, by the second here. Uh, the value of f at t plus delta t is the value of f plus delta t times uh, df dt, which we actually know because df dt uh, is what is given by our differential equation. So how do we go from there uh, to to finding a numerical solution? Well, oh, sorry, I should say before going on, um, that's an approximation. Um, people often write it in the following form. f of t plus delta t is f of t, the value before uh, 
delta t has passed, plus delta t times the derivative, the rate of change, the dft, which we know is by the equation is big F, plus other stuff which will involve the second derivative and so on. How fast, what's the rate of change of the rate of change? How fast is the velocity changing? And um, according to um, uh, sort of the mathematics, you can expand that and those further terms will look like delta t squared. So if delta t is small, delta t squared will be smaller. And so there is a theory that would allow you uh, to actually work out the next term and make the expansion uh, more exact. And those methods are often called Runge-Kutta methods. And there's a Runge-Kutta formula that's more exact than the approximation we're using here. But the approximation we're using here is that we're taking the first two terms uh, of, of this expansion called the Taylor expansion. Uh, we're using the rate of change and the initial position to get an approximate to the next position. So, uh, in practice, what you do is you divide time up into steps. So we're going to start at some time t0, which we took to be 0 earlier on, and then we're going to work out the approximate solution at time delta t, uh, which we'll call t1, and then time 2 times delta t, which we'll call t2, and then times 3 times delta t. And so we're going to use the Euler approximation to go from, we're going to start off knowing what the value is at, at uh, t equals 0, for example. We'll use the Euler approximation to guess or to work out approximately what the value is at t1 after delta t has passed. Then we'll use that to try and work out the value at t2. And as you can see here, um, this is an approximation. So at each of these uh, discretized values of time, we have an approximate f. And if between uh, you know ti and ti plus 1, the df dt has changed a good bit, as we can kind of see between t2 and t3, well, then the approximation is not going to be uh, so exact. So this is uh, an approximation. The uh, f sub n is an approximation to the value that the function would have at the time tn. And the time tn, in turn, is the notation we're using to mean the time uh, after n delta t's has passed. So then putting all that together, uh, using the Euler approximation, we have that f n plus 1, the approximate value at uh, n plus 1 times delta t, is equal to the approximate in our approximation is equal to the, the approximate value at fn after n delta t's plus this extra bit, which as I said is like multiplying the time by the rate of change. It's like assuming the cyclist has traveled uh, five meters if they were going five meters per second for a second. Um, and so that then gives you an iterative solution. You start off with f of zero, uh, that's with n equals to zero, that allows you to work out f1, then uh, if you put n equals 1, you get f2 is equal to f1 plus delta t, uh, big F of f1, uh, t, t1, etc. And so you can keep going. Okay, And so the f, the big F, is the thing that's on the right-hand side of the differential equation. So in our case, that says that hn plus 1 is equal to hn, plus the stuff that would be at the right-hand side of the differential equation. So that's uh, i, the value of the, of, of the input current, uh, the input flow of water, at tn minus uh, hn. Uh, again, over tau, multiplied by delta t. So that there is a numerical formula that allows us to go step by step. We know h0, we work out h1 approximately, we work out h2, we work out h3, and that gives us uh, an approximate set of uh, numbers describing the uh, behavior of the solution as time passes. And uh, here it's for a bucket of water, but the same numerical techniques are used uh, to find approximate solutions to the leaky integrated fire, uh, equations to allow us to calculate how a neuron modeled by the leaky integrated fire equations uh, changes with time. And we'll talk about that in the second half of this lecture. So to summarize, we worked out an equation for the height of water in a bucket, and I've told you that that same equation is going to apply uh, uh, to the uh, leaky integrated fire model of the neuron. We looked at the solution for constant input. That gave us some uh, intuition as to how the, uh, di the solutions of differential equation behaves and how it would behave for variable input. We saw that it filters the input, it smooths it out, and we learned how to uh, solve the differential equation numerically using Euler's approximation. And as I said, uh, in the next half of this lecture, we'll, sh we'll talk about the actual leaky entry and fire uh, neuron and how this intuition will help us to understand something about how uh, neurons behave. <laughs>